There's a passage where the Buddha describes three ways of gaining discernment. You gain discernment through listening, through thinking, and through meditating. In fact, I saw a TV show recently. It's a French TV show on the Dharma, and they spent the entire 15 minutes just getting those three points across. But the important factor there is it's not just any listening or any thinking or any meditation that's going to give rise to discernment. This is where another list of teachings comes in, factors for stream entry. Now the name of the list may sound a little bit exalted, you don't feel quite ready yet for stream entry, but the four factors are really important for every meditator, regardless of where you are on the path and how close you are to awakening. All four factors are important. They basically give you an idea of who and what to listen to, how to think, and how to meditate. The who and the what are, on the one hand, associating with admirable friends, in other words, people who exemplify the Dharma in their practice, in their daily behavior. The Buddha lists four qualities here. It's generosity, virtue, conviction, and discernment. Those the qualities you want to look for in someone you want to study from. If they don't have conviction in the Buddha's awakening, you don't know what they have conviction in, something someplace else. If they're not virtuous, you can't trust yourself around them. If they're not generous, you always wonder what they're trying to get out of you. And if not really discerning, you wonder why you're there. So you want to look for these four qualities. You want to find someone who has conviction in the Buddha's awakening, which is basically conviction in the principle of karma. That is, through our efforts that we shape our experience, and we can learn how to do it in a skillful way, all the way to the end of suffering. One of the big misunderstandings about karma is that what your present moment here is something that you can trace back to past actions. Everything you experience now can be traced back, but then you can Take this present moment and make choices about it. Move on to the future. There's a problem with that right there. If everything you're experiencing right now is a result of past actions, how can you make any choices about where you're going to go? Because even your choices will be forced on you by past actions. This is one of the really intriguing parts of the Buddhist teachings, is that what you're experiencing right now is not only the result of past actions, but it's a result of things you're doing right now. And this element of present karma right here is really important. And this is why we meditate, is to get that present element under control, to explore what freedoms we have and how to use them best. So that's the kind of person you're looking for, someone who has faith in that principle that we are free to choose. And it's our choices that shape our life and have an impact on other people. And this is one of the reasons why meditation is not a selfish endeavor. If your mind is a mess, it's going to be a mess with other people. If your mind is straightened out, at the very least you'll be a lot less of a burden on others. You notice sometimes as people get older, they suddenly reach a point where you can't get to them anymore. They're in their world. Maybe because they're too sick. Maybe because they're, something's going wrong inside their brains. And you stop and reflect to think that this could happen to you. And what do you want to have with you when you're stuck in your own little world? Well, you want to have a well-trained mind. And at the very least, you'll be a lot less of a burden on other people. So you want to. Associate with people who can teach you about action from experience, what's skillful and what's not. That gets into the next factor, which is listening to the true Dharma. The Buddha gives you various tests for what is true Dharma. When you put it into action, what does it lead to? It's basically the, the big test. And the tests that he teaches to the Galamas are the tests that he taught to go to me. In other words, looking at the impact 
that the Dharma has on the people around you, if you practice, if it's creating burdens for them, it gives us something wrong. If it gets you entangled with other people, there's something wrong with it. Look at the qualities of mind you're developing. If it leads you to want to be well known, it leads you to want to be discontented with what you've got. Okay, there's something wrong with that Dharma. And then you look at where it hit, where it's headed. Is it going to lead to dispassion? Is it going to lead to more passion? Is it going to lead to being unfettered? Or is it going to lead to be tied down with more fetters? In other words, you know the true Dharma by one seeing how the person who teaches behaves. And then secondly, look at what happens when you take that person's Dharma and you put it to use in your own life. What are you becoming as day and nights fly past by past, as the Buddha asked one time. So once you've learned the Dharma, the next step is to figure out how do I use this to put an end to suffering. That's what the third step, or the third factor of stream entry is, which is appropriate attention. It basically comes down to seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, trying to figure out where is the stress here, what is the stress. The Buddha says clinging to the five aggregates. What are the aggregates? What is clinging? You want to explore that. You want to comprehend what's going on. Because all too often when we're suffering from one thing or another, we're not looking at things in terms of the aggregates. We're just moaning about how much we're suffering. And all we can think about is how we want to get rid of it. Whereas the Buddha says you've got to comprehend it. And to comprehend it, you have to take it apart into these various elements to figure out where the clinging is, where you're feeding on things, basically. As for the path, that's something you want to develop. This, too, is a factor of appropriate attention, figuring out how you're going to develop right concentration, right view, all the factors of the path. How to recognize them when they're there, how to develop them, and when they're not there, how to give rise to them. Because appropriate attention isn't just about dividing things into four noble truths, but it's trying to figure out how to get engaged in the duties that are appropriate to them. And then finally, the fourth factor is practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma, which basically means practicing for the sake of disenchantment and dispassion. You're trying to work on developing right concentration, feed the mind with right concentration. So when you look at the other ways you've been feeding it all along, you can begin to think, right, this is an area that's unskillful. And I'd be better off not feeding there. Not only would I be better off, but the people around me would be better off too. Because as long as you need to f feel the need to feed on something, either physically or emotionally, you're not going to want to see the drawbacks of that. Because after all, it's your survival. But if you provide the mind with another source of nourishment inside, as we're doing when we meditate, That puts you in a better position. You can look back on the, on the things you used to snack on, and you begin to realize that it's not really worth it. You're not hungry for that kind of thing anymore. That's how you meditate, so as to give rise to discernment. We're aiming at dispassion, we're aiming at disenchantment. It may not sound attractive, but the reward that comes is when you give up your old feeding habits and learn new feeding habits is you strengthen the mind to a point where it doesn't need to feed anymore. And that's where things really get good. Because as long as you need to feed, you're tied down to your food source. You can't really wander around as much as you like. Let's just say the Arahants have a range that nobody can trace. Because they don't leave crumbs behind. They're not feeding on anything. You can't see their chew marks on anything. So that's the result of discernment. And the way you develop it is, as I said, it's not, not just listening, but trying to find people who really are admirable friends and then 
listening to the true Dharma from them. It's not just thinking, it's learning how to think in terms of appropriate attention, Four Noble Truths and the duties appropriate to them. That's not just any meditating. I mean, you can read about meditation courses where they're going to get you to feel a sense of oneness and then to learn how to just enjoy that oneness, or whatever. But the meditation that the Buddha is talking about is the meditation that's practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma. Now you're learning how to develop a sense of disenchantment and dispassion for your old feeding habits, learning how to feed the mind on the well-being that comes from concentration, learning how to feed the mind in the sense of relief that comes when you see, I've been holding on to this, clinging to that, and I don't need to do that anymore. That's what's good about discernment, is that it gives you freedom. So look carefully at how you develop it, because there's all different kinds of discernment, all different kinds of wisdom. But the discernment the Buddha is talking about is one that gives you freedom that you just can't even imagine. And as he said, this freedom, if you could have a, make a deal that they would spear you with a hundred spears in the morning and a hundred spears at noon and a hundred spears in the evening and do this for a hundred years, three hundred spears a day. But you could have the guarantee that at the end of that hundred years that you would gain an awakening. The Buddha said it would be well worth the deal. And you wouldn't feel that you'd gained awakening through pain and suffering. You gained awakening through joy. That's that good. <laughs>